It's good to see each and every one of you today. Hope you've all had a wonderful weekend. Thank you for joining us. And of course, we've got Family and Friends Day on the horizon. So I hope that you're inviting friends to come be part of that and family. And uh, if you do want to contribute some eggs, you're welcome to talk to me about that too for the egg hunt. The kids always get a, a kick out of that. And of course, if you want to put you know candy in there and such, we keep them in here until we go out there and hide and put them out there for the kids. So if you'd like to do that, you're welcome to. And this morning, I wanted to share a lesson with you that I hope will offer you a, an incentive of encouragement today. Have you ever considered how many people were present on the day of Pentecost? Now, if you don't know, on the day of Pentecost, we know it comes from Acts chapter 2. The church starts in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. But not to get into that particular detail, Josephus, who is a Roman or a Roman historian, a noted Jewish historian, excuse me, is known for quoting that on this particular fest festival season in that time, there were anywhere towards one million or more Jews on the day of Pentecost. Now, I want you to think about that number with me. That is a conservative number that there were one million because there were several other Jews who lived in the surrounding area who could not be necessarily accounted for having come to the Pentecost festival. Festival. Now, the Bible tells us that of the gospel day, when the gospel was preached, 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom on this particular day in Acts chapter 2. So when you look at that number, and my point is driving toward Acts chapter 11, how many people did not obey the gospel on Pentecost? Well, if you factor in that a million, Josephus says, well, there, that means that 997,000 did not become Christians. Now, we hear that number 3,000, and we're encouraged as we should be because that is an important aspect of the church, sharing the good news, making people become aware of the gospel, convicted of sin, obeying the gospel, wonderful news. But we know that on Acts chapter 2, 3,000 souls were added, and there were a million people on Pentecost. Now, if you factor in that number, if 1 million were present, 10% would have been 100,000. 5% would have been 50,000. 1% of that number would have been 10,000. So as, as Josephus is noted for quoting, if 1 million people were present on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that means one, if one half of 1%, 0.005 had obeyed the gospel, there would have been 5,000 baptisms on that day. But we know there are only 3,000 souls. That means that point zero zero three actually obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost of the people who were actually there. That means that 997,000 did not obey the gospel. Now, there's a factor to that who actually was able to hear, and we know that all nations were there, and so the gospel needed need to be spread. But one thing we want to point out by sharing this number with you isn't to say about evangelism failing on Pentecost Day. That's not the emphasis here. We understand that evangelism is a primary vital work of the kingdom. And of course, today we may hear brethren lovingly and sincerely say, we need to get back to the way they were winning souls on the day of Pentecost. Well, let me give you a fact check. They weren't winning souls left and right if you look at the numbers. That's not accurate. The truth is most people like them today Reject the gospel, sadly. But what we want to stress today is, number one, evangelism is an important part. We have four people in our Bible correspondence. I love that. I've talked to a couple of them already, and they're enjoying the course. And, and I want to invite you, if you know folks who would like to receive our free Bible correspondence, we've ordered more material. We've actually run out of the material. And uh, if you have someone who wants to join, or maybe you want to join, you know, I'd like to get better Bible knowledge. All I need your address. I'll send that to you. And we also want to stress and help people understand that the only way to get to heaven is through obedience of the gospel. But folks, we cannot overlook an important factor in being engaged in encouragement. Today, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles and those who will be watching us on YouTube to Acts chapter 11. If you would turn with me there. And I want us to look at a, a brother in Christ who is engaged in encouragement. <coughs> I appreciate you being here today, and I want to encourage you to feel good about being a Christian, to feel good about the fact that you 
were one of the few in this world who chose to obey. To see the urgency that everyone needs to obey before it's too late. But to recognize, to recognize that in order for us to all get to heaven, we've got to continue to help push each other in the back towards greater to grow, towards greater faith and service. You know, I like what Brother Bob from KW, when he came and did our meeting uh, one of the days, he came here and he, it, this has stuck with me for a long time. He, uh, I think he brought Kyle up to the side here, if you remember this illustration, right? And he said, we have so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us push, you know, and of course, keeping it in the text there to what he was talking about. You know, if we think about moving out of our, our way of discipleship, we've got Moses to say, no, I went to the desert, but God helped me to get back into it. And he said, if I decide to go this way, well, wait a minute, you got Saul. He was a sinner, but now get in it. We're all imperfect, but you got to keep the fight up. And his point was, if we feel like moving out of the, the, the faithful realm of God, we've got these people, each other is what I'm implying here, including Bible characters, the Hall of Faith, who push us back in the fight to say, you got to keep going. You cannot bow yourself out of your discipleship. And yeah, we know there's lost souls out there, but don't get discouraged when you think the world just doesn't seem to care anymore. Here's a, here's a note. In one way, they've never actually cared. Because if you look at the numbers on Pentecost, 3,000 souls is wonderful. But there were a million, Josephus says there. 997 did not obey. That's sad. Of course it's sad. So today we don't want to overstress let me put it this way. We don't want to minimize evangelism, but we also don't want to minimize what's going on in Acts chapter 11, which is the fact that there are disciples who are engaged in encouragement. And I'm saying this to say today we want to be encouraged. Tomorrow we want to be encouraged. Family and Friends Day, I want to encourage folks. Be a faithful disciple. You may want today get out of the fight. I'm just ready to. Brethren, you and I need to be that Moses, that Paul, that Timothy to say, no, you're getting back in this. We're trying to get to heaven and you're going with us and we're not going to bow out. And life gets hard, but stay in the fight. So I want to invite you again to turn to Acts 11 and I appreciate you being there. We're going to look at verses 22 through 26. So when news of the church spread and the, the apostles in Jerusalem, when they learned that the church, a church had been planted in Antioch. I say a church. The church had spread to Antioch. The apostles wanted to send someone who would go to Antioch to see how things were going. This is a good thing to see. So the, the apostles decided we're going to send Barnabas. Now Barnabas could have said no. Barnabas could have said, I got stuff I've got to do in Jerusalem. I don't have time to go to Antioch. He didn't know what was going on in Antioch. But we know that Barnabas, who was also called the son of encouragement, was going to go, and he did. And we today encourage people when we go to see their work. You know, I love KW, I love Quitman, Pleasant Grove, Laurel. We think of all of our brethren, and we pray for them. They have small numbers, or at least many of them do, save a few. And when we think about these numbers, we encourage them. We exhort them if they have a meeting or some kind of special event. We support each other. And so what Barnabas is doing is he sees the need to go and encourage these people. He's being told, the apostles, go, Barnabas, and see how things are going. And Barnabas will go to Antioch. And so when brethren are in a hard place, we need to be reminded that there are people like Barnabas out there who help bring a boost of energy to our life. So when Barnabas got to Antioch, the ones who had brought the gospel to Antioch were probably very excited that the work had reached that, oh, y'all learned that the apostles had heard about us working here in Antioch? Well, yeah, that's what I'm here for, Barnabas. I'm sure they would have been very excited to know, hey, we've heard y'all, uh, there's a congregation here in Antioch. The apostles have heard about it, and I'm here to, to, to give them a report. If you would have been those brethren on Antioch, I'm sure you would have been excited to know why wow, the apostles have taken interest in how we're doing. So when he got to Antioch, the new converts would have been encouraged and interested. Barnabas certainly was in their well-being. In fact, firstly, look at verse 22 and 23, these two verses. First, he rejoiced. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. 
And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, look at what it says. What was his mentality when he saw what was going on? If the grace of God had been received, what's your Bible say there? He was glad. And exhorted them. Notice this. We're going to come back to this. First off, Barnabas, when he finds that there are people who've obeyed the gospel, he was so happy about it. And exhorted them that with purpose of heart. You know, we talked about having an open heart today. I appreciate all of the comments from my Bible class. I sincerely do. That with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. And the word you could see there, if your translation is different, he urged. So when Barnabas got to Antioch, he saw the grace of God had been received. Folks, that's a wonderful thing. How many of you get excited when you look at a fellow believer or someone you don't even know? Maybe you go to PTP, maybe you go to special events where you meet other brethren, and you look at them and you first off are just excited. Those people, this individual accepted the grace of God. Now let me make a, a point that I, I'm, I'm going to try to adequately convey. Evangelism is so important, and I'm grateful for every work we can do. But I don't want, and I use the word but with respect to the mighty work of evangelism, I don't want to overlook any new convert or brother or sister in Christ and fail to give them the incentive to have the purpose of heart to cleave to the Lord. That's encouragement. That is what Barnabas is going to do to simply check on the report. He finds out they've obeyed the gospel and he is so happy about it. And his next point is, now I need for you brethren in Antioch to decide that you're going to cleave to the Lord like glue. I need you to decide that you're going to do that. See, when we think about what Barnabas is doing, his reaction was encouragement. That, hey, there is this community in Antioch of believers who are able to now engage the people in Antioch of the gospel news. We know Titus 2 tells us that grace is offered to everyone, that by Romans 5 it is accepted by faith, that we hear it, we obey it, Romans 10, 17, a cross-reference. Thankfully, these brethren chose to do that. And so the envoy of the apostles were rejoicing. And whenever good is being done, whenever you see a brother or a sister doing something good, find reason to rejoice. Brethren, this will encourage you. Today, I want you to think, who could I look at today? I know we think of other, maybe even Alan. Maybe we think of recent works where we help feed for, for Brother Isaac and his recent loss. Maybe we want to think about what encouragement give, do I find in works that are being done? Because that's what Barnabas is excited about. Whatever good is being done, we rejoice. His rejoicing would have encouraged those new converts. And folks, whenever we embark on something new, we ought to praise God. You know, I love the fact that we're going to be mobilizing our youth to do new things. We're talking next Sunday with the parents about these efforts. When something good is being done in the work of the Lord, let's be aware of it. Let's be excited about it, encouraging our brothers and sisters. Philippians 4.4 4 says, rejoice in the Lord. You know that word rejoice in the Lord. We're in Christ. Let's be excited about being in Christ. Because, you know, Elijah, what was his greatest, what was one of his greatest things when he, remember he ran from Jezebel, he got discouraged that she was going to have him killed by the next day. So he runs from where he was and he gets isolated under a tree. And you know what he says? What does Elijah say? I am the only one left. God just in my life. Do you know what Jehovah told him after the angel fed him and took care of him for a little bit? He said, you're not the only one. There are thousands who have not been to me. Folks, what we do in finding encouragement is in the fact that today there are people like you and me here and in different places who have not bent the knee to the world. And that is what provides us an incentive to cleave unto the Lord. I hope it does. Barnabas, it says, was glad when he got to Antioch. And the Bible tells us he was specifically happy because they accepted the grace of God. And that led him to give them this message. Now stick to the Lord like glue. 
He knew the only way that they would be remain faithful is if they decided right then and there to hold on to the Lord no matter what. So he encouraged their faith. Look at verse 23 again. He said, Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was happy, and exhorted them or urged them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now, that is a wonderful phrase that you see there, purpose of heart. You know, I could tell you today, do you love the Lord? Are you ready to stick to him like glue? You know, there's a song, I think, uh, you and I are stuck like glue. I don't know who, I forget who sings. But, uh, but anyway, you think about that perhaps. You see, I don't want to tell you, stick to the Lord, cleave to him, without you having a purpose in heart for doing it. And brethren, that's what's important for you to see this morning. Be encouraged that there are others who are just like you, who accepted the grace of God. And by accepting that grace, I'm happy to know I'm not alone in this fight. And then I want to encourage you as you encourage me. Let's, with our purpose, stick to the Lord all the way to the very end. Stick to it. Because we desperately need people to help us with that. Because we know temptations out there. We know that the Bible even says in the first century there would be a falling away, and there was. So today, I don't want us to dismiss how important it is to be an encourager. There will be temptations. There will be trials. And Barnabas knew the only way for them to remain faithful is if they decided immediately, with purpose of heart, to stick to the Lord no matter what would happen. And certainly we need others to encourage us to hold tightly. The word cleave here, King James says cleave. The word translates from the Greek to mean to adhere to, literally to be stuck like glue. And where do you see this word cleave? Again, you see it in Hebrew in the particular text I'm thinking of. But where do you see this cleave word again when it refers to cleaving? You remember in the beginning when it talks about cleaving to his wife? So the point that Barnabas is trying to make is you stick to the Lord like super glue. You ever stuck your finger together with super glue? I have. Man, that's just unpleasant. Unpleasant. But Barnabas is so encouraged that there's a church plan. He's encouraged that they have accepted. And he exhorts them. It's I'm exhorting you this morning. I think about what Bob said in that lesson. When you want to walk out of the arena... Moses, let him push you back in the arena. When you're ready to give up, let David be there to say, I beat Goliath. You can beat this monster in your life. You can do it. Get back in the fight. What Barnabas does, I mean, it's interesting, brother, because it's in the Bible in Acts 11. He could have said a number of things to the church at Antioch. That's what I find interesting. But what the Bible says is when he got there, first, he was so happy they obeyed the gospel, but two, his very next initiative was now, you need to stick to the Lord like glue. Why would he say that? Because life makes us want to walk away from Christ. The course of life, the bombardment of evil, those who just don't care, indifferent, who don't want to obey, who even mock Christianity, it pushes you out of the arena. So what I want to do is say to you, God's here. If God be for us, who can be against us? There are, there are people here today who can attest to what God has done for them. We look in the Bible and there are witnesses like Moses. There are those who've lived a faithful life for God who can help us see, I can do this. Barnabas goes to Antioch. He's so happy to see what's happened. And he exhorts them. Stick to the Lord. Don't fall away. We desperately need to continue to do such a thing in the lives of those who are working. We don't want to hang loosely to the Lord. We don't want to hang loosely. We want to strive and remain faithful. And thirdly, here's what he continues to do. He encouraged them by his way of life. Please look at verse 24. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and many people were added unto the Lord. So again, we're not minimizing evangelism. What Barnabas does when he gets to Antioch, verse 24, his attitude is, so you need to stick to the Lord, but now we need to keep winning souls. Verse 24. People were being added to the church in Antioch. So, again, my goal was not to say evangelism is not important. Most folks don't obey the gospel. My point is he was happy for who did obey. It was not a numbers game. It was about who is sincerely open-minded and willing to receive the gospel and how can we help them come into the kingdom. Verse 24, Barnabas was a good man. There are many, 
excuse me, there are a few people in the Bible that was the Bible calls them were good. Barnabas so was one of them. That word good means in Greek he was profitable in his goodness. He was useful because of his goodness. He was profitable. These are good words to use. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, this could mean he had a miraculous bestowment where he could use one of the nine spiritual gifts. But it also could mean that he was full of knowledge, which is what we must have today, Ephesians 5, 18. But whatever it was, he was useful with his ability to help the church in Antioch not only learn to stick to the Lord, that means they had to grow in their faith, but you also have to evangelize. You've got to win more souls, and Barnabas helped them see that incentive. And so he was profitable. This great man of faith, full of faith, helped them live in a way that would encourage others to, hey, come out of the world, come out of darkness, become a Christian, live the way God would want you to live. Brethren, let me reinforce to you, living right will not be popular, okay? Living right in the eyes of God will not be popular, and you're going to get beat over the head for the way you choose to live. In fact, the Bible says they think it's strange you don't run with the crowd. That's strange. You don't drink, Seth. I don't drink. That, that's strange. If you don't, you've never done this, and I don't, I've never done that. Why is that weird? Now, I'm not trying to condemn the Lord saves us all. I'm still a sinner, but I'm not going to go do it. Now, am I condemning? I'm simply pointing out the world just thinks it's odd. Everybody does that. I don't. You being a Christian in your life with the people in your life are going to give you, perhaps not all of them, but a good bit of people are going to think strange of you for being a Christian. Can I reinforce to you, like Barnabas did in Antioch, hold on to the Lord, don't let go of it. When you want to, let Moses push you back. Let David remind you, he may be Goliath. If maybe you're a Jonah. I just want to walk away from the Lord. Hey, that's not going to help you. Go do what the Lord wants us to do. Do our, do our work. Remember, there are many in the Bible who will push you back in the fight. But also, remember, there are people lost out there, and most aren't going to obey. But that doesn't mean we get discouraged. There are those who did obey. Remember Elijah? He got alone. Don't start thinking, I'm just one of the only few left. That's not true. There are many there are many who haven't bent the knee to the world. So living right is an encouragement to each other. Fourthly and lastly, look at verses 25 and 26. And the lesson will be yours. He encouraged them by seeking others for the work. Verses 25 and 26 tell us, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus. Who's your Bible say he went to get? Interesting. He went to get Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught many people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So y'all remember Saul, right? Who was Saul of Tarsus? At one time, he was wreaking havoc on the church. He has obeyed the gospel by this point. And what Saul, who will become Paul, does, Barnabas looks at this situation in Antioch, and he says there's a lot of work that needs to be done in Antioch. It says they stayed a whole year. And what Barnabas does is he takes an assessment. And he, he admits something that we all need to admit at times. I'm going to need some help. And Barnabas says, I know a man perfect for this work. And he says, Saul Tarsus. This is something he needs to do. So Saul is brought to Antioch, and you know for Saul that had to be a shot in his arm because at first he was killing Christians, arresting them, dragging them out of their homes, and now, hey, Saul, we got something you can do. You imagine for Saul that was a shot. That's why Barnabas is called the son of encouragement. He found people that he wanted to engage. Like our youth, I want to engage our youth, and I don't want it to be seen as it's a burden. You need to be a faithful disciple for Christ. You need to do it your whole life, and you need to see the need to win the lost. And you can do it one way, by serving and living right. And so Barnabas goes to Antioch, and he says he stayed there a year, and he realized that a perfect man for the job. You know, I'm encouraged by our song leaders, by our men, by our ladies. I hope that you never feel that we've not encouraged you enough. And maybe we need to do more of that, something I thought about. I imagine this was a great encouragement to Saul, and I imagine this was a great encouragement to the church at Antioch. Barnabas wasn't about bringing glory to himself. He was looking at it from the perspective of how can we help this congregation in Antioch be stronger and evangelistic 
and involve and engage people. And you know one way to do it, folks? Is simply by encouraging and exhorting them. That's one way you can do it. So I want you to think about this. That though many choose not to obey the gospel, let us not forget that there are many who did obey the gospel. If you look around the room, there are many here who accepted the grace of God. And we want to encourage you, cleave to the Lord. When you want to get out of the fight, I'm going to say it one more time. Let Moses and people like David, Josiah, we talked about him last Sunday. Let them push you back in and tell you, you can do this. You can, but you've got to purpose it in your heart to do it. And you've got to decide, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to fight. And you know what? I'm going to be barnless. I want to help the next person be pushed to do right, live right, serve. And brethren, when we do that, we are indeed engaged in, in encouragement and in evangelism. Today, I want to extend the invitation to you. If you're here and you haven't been a faithful disciple, you don't have to continue in that feeling of guilt and disappointment. You don't have to. If you want to be right with God, God's invitation is the very point where you can come forward and say, you know what, I want to ask for the church as a whole to pray on my behalf for this thing that's in my life. It's bugged me. It's nagged at me. I need encouragement with it. That's a good thing. I want to encourage you. I want to help you, but we want to know about it. We can pray about it together, and we can help you overcome. Maybe you're here and you haven't obeyed the gospel if you're ready to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2.38 tells us it's for the forgiveness of sins. Romans 6 tells us it's a burial. What am I burying? Well, spiritually, I'm burying the old self, the self that was running after the rudiments of the world, resurrected into newness of life. If you have a need today, will you confess Christ as the Son of God, repent of your sins? Will you be repentant? Whatever you need, don't hesitate to make the right choice. Let's be a Barnabas. Let's be an exhorter. Won't you come as together we stand and as we sing? I am resolved no longer.